Hello, everyone. Welcome to our audience here in Martinos Auditorium in the Granoff Center for the Creative Arts at Brown University, as well as to our virtual audience. We're glad you're joining us for the Re-Examining Conservation Exhibition and Symposium presented by the Brown Arts Institute and Creature Conserve. The symposium features Brown faculty and students, as well as a stellar lineup of guest artists. Complete schedule details can be found in the digital program or the symposium website, which can be found at go.brown.edu slash reexaminingconservation or via the QR code posted at the entrance of the auditorium. My name is David Frank. I'm a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Philosophy in the Kogut Institute for the Humanities here at Brown. Please join me in remembering that Brown University is located in Providence, Rhode Island, on lands which are within the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Indian Tribe. We acknowledge that the Narragansett Indian Tribe was dispossessed from their lands by the forces of settler colonialism, and we acknowledge our ongoing responsibility to understand and respond to the legacy of those actions. We acknowledge that the, that the Narragansett and other indigenous peoples have called Providence home for centuries and continue to do so today. We acknowledge with humility and respect the Narragansett Indian tribe, whose ancestors stewarded these lands with great care, and we commit to working together to honor our past and build our future with truth. Please take some time, if you haven't already, to explore Creature Conserve's biennial art exhibition, Reexamining Conservation, Questions at the Intersection of the Arts and Sciences, installed here in our Cohen and Atrium galleries, as well as the beautifully curated reading room on level two of the building. The exhibition is free and open to the public through June 10th, and for those of you joining us from afar, an audio tour is available via the exhibition website. We're delighted to be partnering with Brown University Bookstore, who's carrying titles authored by many of our symposium participants, and is offering a 20% discount on purchases of those titles made between now and Saturday April 23rd, the discount will be automatically applied to purchases made in person at the bookstore. Thank you to everyone who has worked so hard to make these events possible, especially Talia Field, faculty director of the Brown Arts Institute, the staff of the BAI, the Creature Conserve team helmed by Dr. Lucy Spellman, the Animal Studies Group at Brown, and to the Tomaquag Museum's Indigenous Empowerment Network, who has been helping in conjunction with Creature Conserve on this exhibition in efforts to further amplify the voices of the indigenous community in Rhode Island. Okay, so I'm doing this as a public class, uh, so I'm gonna frame this as, uh, you know, we're almost at the end of the semester, so I'm gonna sum up um, what we've been thinking about in our course. So our ecotopian lineage starts with Moore's Utopia, branches to socialist and anarchist utopians like William Morris, eco-feminists like Ursula K. Le Guin, Colin Bach's Ecotopia, and more recently, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy and his international climate ecotopia, The Ministry for the Future. Our class discussed utopias of abundance versus sufficiency, eco-modernist utopias emphasizing technological decoupling versus eco-feminist and eco-socialist utopias emphasizing systemic, economic, and cultural changes, We've considered non-anthropocentric environmental ethics, utopianism and anti-utopianism in political philosophy, Green New Deals and other real ecotopian policy proposals like degrowth, universal basic income, universal rights for all animals, and legal rights for natural objects. So as the exhibit asks us, I'm gonna start by re-examining conservation using utopia. Conservation itself has been both a real utopia and dystopia, but its future is open-ended, yet to be determined. Consider the idea in history of protected areas. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature defines a protected area as, quote, a clearly defined geographical space recognized, dedicated, and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values, unquote. On the one hand, thinking genealogically, U.S. national park style fortress conservation can be seen from the point of view of the kind of utopian project of U.S. settler colonialism, which I've already mentioned. Parks are like Utopus's island utopia carved out of a stolen continent, bounded ecotopian enclaves created through dispossession and displacement. 
On Cronin's account, they were ideologically dedicated to the preservation of a gendered, imagined wild frontier and in celebration of a landscape aesthetic of the sublime. Parks arguably separate humans from nature and commodify the experience of nature for tourists arriving by plane and car. All utopias contain dystopia. The success of this utopian project, of course, meant real dystopia for the dispossessed and displaced, some of the first but certainly not last conservation refugees. So that's the bad news. On the other hand, it's hard to deny that protected areas should, should also be celebrated as remarkable moral achievements. They continue to protect and cultivate real values, both anthropocentric or human-centered, economic, aesthetic, scientific, spiritual, and non-anthropocentric, the diversity, lives, and worlds of our neglected kin, our fellow creatures, our contemporaries of all species. Protected areas are essential refugia for non-human ecologies, safeguarding autonomous or wild nature, and the resilience of life itself. An attempted synthesis, an adequate environmental ethics and politics of conservation would account for both social and ecological justice, cultural and natural values, but most importantly would encourage us to see all areas as in some ways and to some extent protected areas. Nature is out there, but it is also here, as the environmental justice movement puts it, where we live, work, and play. So we're gonna play this morning. Um, I'm gonna start off this kind of micro speculative fiction fest by reading from Kim Stanley Robinson's chapter, Imagining the Results of a Successful Global Half-Earth Rewilding Project, the dedication of half of the Earth's lands and seas to conservation via huge continent-scale networks of protected areas and corridors uh, for our fellow creatures. After I read from Robinson, we'll hear students read their original speculative fiction, Imagining Futures for Conservation, Multi-Species Ecotopias. Ideas explored will include returning national parks to indigenous stewardship, the perspectives of wild and domesticated animals, the commodification of nature, tensions between cultural and natural values, and tensions between ethical individualism, concern for individual creatures' welfare, and holism, concern for species, ecosystems, or the land. We hope you enjoy these readings and that they might spark conversations to help us all re-examine conservation together. And please find me. Um, we can have a conversation today. I'll be around. So this is chapter 97 from The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. There are about 60 billion birds alive on Earth. They've been quicker than anyone to inhabit the rewilded land and thrive. Recall they are all descended from theropods. They're dinosaurs still alive among us. 60 billion is a good number, a healthy number. The great North Tundra did not melt enough to stop the return of the caribou herds to their annual migrations. Animals moved out from the refuge of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska and repopulated the top of the world. In Siberia, they're establishing a Pleistocene park and reintroducing a resuscitated version of the woolly mammoth. This has been a problematic project. But meanwhile, the reindeer have been coming back there, along with all the rest of the Siberian creatures, musk oxen, elk, bears, wolves, even Siberian tigers. In the boreal forests to the south of the tundra and taiga, wolves and grizzlies have prowled outward from the Canadian Rockies. This is the biggest forest on Earth, wrapping the world around the 60th latitude north, and all of it now being returned to health. It's the same right down to the equator, and then past the equator, south to the southern ends of the world. Certain inhospitable areas everywhere had been almost empty of humans all along. Now these have been connected up by habitat corridors, and the animals living in these emptier lands are protected and nourished as needed. Often this means just leaving them alone. Many are now tagged, and more all the time. There's coming into being a kind of internet of animals, whatever that means. Better perhaps to say they are citizens now, and have citizens' rights, and therefore a census is being taken. Watersheds upstream from cities are adopted by urban dwellers who observe their fellow citizens from afar, along with making occasional visits in person. Wild animals' lives and deaths are being noted by people. They mean something, they are part of a meaning. Not since the Paleolithic have animals meant so much to humans, been regarded so closely and fondly by we their cousins. 
The land that supports these animals also supports our farms and cities as well in a big network of networks. What's good is what's good for the land. There are fewer humans than before. The demographic peak is in the past. We're a little fewer than we were before and on a trajectory for that to continue. People speak now of an optimum number of humans. Some say two billion, others four, no one really knows. It will be an experiment. All of us in balance, we the people, meaning we the living beings, in a single ecosystem, which is the planet. Fewer people, more wild animals. Right now that feels like coming back from a time of illness, like healing, like getting healthy the structure of feeling in our time. Population dynamics in play, as always, maybe that makes us all living together in this biosphere, some kind of super organism, who can say? In a high meadow, wild bighorn sheep, their lambs gamble. When you see that gambling with your own eyes, you'll know something you didn't know before. What will you know? Hard to say, but something like this. Whether life means anything or not, joy is real. Life lives, life is living. So if Francesca's here, she can read her piece. Next. Hello. Oh, this is so intimidating. <laughs> um, I'm Francesca. I'm a junior here at Brown studying environmental science. Um, and I decided to write a short story about um, what it would be like for indigenous people to have uh, ownership of national parks. So I guess it's a context I'll give you. I see the mist rising in the early morning air. Everything I know about this journey is, for, is what I learned from my parents. Migration is what we do every year, and this is my first. I was born in the cold, and I don't know what to expect. I've heard stories about the beauty of the northern plains in Yellowstone, how million, millions of us used to run and play in the Great Plains, where the grass becomes more and more green as the first few weeks evolve. Apparently, this is not how it used to be. There were only 300 of us left by 1901. Humans, that's what I think they're called, swarmed the lands, killing us by the thousands. They claimed it was necessary, but we all know it was just for sport. Their cheap, disgusting attempt at recreation. Once there were too few of us for them to justify their killings, they spent the next century holding cameras up to our snouts. We became a sight to see, an asset to the park they claimed was theirs. They put us on their shirts, mugs, and posters as it, it would have faced their legacy of violence. They started making trails for the humans to follow, clearing trees where they are in their way. They raised land outside the park borders and made more rooms for themselves. They said we were being protected when they confined us to this park. They all claimed to come to the park to see nature when it was really all around them. I'm not sure when exactly, but things began to change. We still say humans, but the friendly kind started to return to the park. They had shared this land with us years before the mass killings had started, but they too were pushed away from their land. Not only did this indigenous humans return, but they also were put in charge. Indigenous stewardship and leadership was brought back. These friendly humans could finally govern and control the territory the way it used to be. They brought harmony back to the plains. They understood the true value of nature, not just viewed as a commodity. They took time to understand our behaviors, our migration, our kin, learning to coexist in peaceful ways. They have a different philosophy from the other humans. I can tell they value nature differently with a better understanding of our ecosystem's interdependence. Since their arrival, our population has thrived. Trees have began to grow on the paths that were once cleared. The water runs clear. Twice as many calves were born from one migration to the next. We were happy again. Our land was back in the right hands. It should have been given back a long time ago. Indigenous humans and bison could relate anew. I did not live to experience the tragedies of the unfriendly humans, but it is a history I can never forget. Thank you. Good morning. 
<clears throat> Good morning, I'm Miti Chetua. Uh, I'm a current first year student at Brown University and I'm studying computer science. Um, my short uh, piece of fiction is going to be about protected areas. Um, so, Dan, look, there's our tour guide for the dome. Robin waved over a woman with a New England Architectural Institute badge on her. Architecture schools across the country vied for scholar tickets to the dome to give their students an insight into the glittering structure and the ecosystem preserved inside. Constructed by esteemed architect Stephen Broad Broadus, um, it was one of the most magnificent imaginations, a dome for animals and indigenous peoples to protect them from the impacts of human activity in the rest of the world. At the time, it was also a political statement to corporations that mindlessly pursued growth. The need for a physical shield from corporate growth aspirations portrayed a stark image of where the world was headed. Hi there, I'm Linda. I'll be your tour guide for today. Um, let's get on the shuttle and get started. She went on explaining the rules and regulations. No photography, no straying from the trail, the usual, and handed us brochures to follow along as we stepped into the shuttle. Soon enough, the cluttering structure of the dome came into view. Once inside, we stepped out onto the station, followed Linda along the trail. We only allow tourists in specific zones, mainly along the outskirts. We've tried to leave the ecosystem completely untouched, and that means letting the indigenous people, flora and fauna, build their own lives with no interference. In order to maintain their privacy, we don't have much documentation of the lands either. All we have is our communications with the indigenous people who tell us their account of what, is true, what it is truly like inside. Robin saw the opportunity and jumped in. Is it truly privacy though? I mean, you put them in a cage and tell them you're protecting them from the harm you yourself are causing. We've been discussing this a lot, actually, I chimed in. I think it protects them from the unyielding, irreversible damage we've already caused. I read that this dome was built as a metaphor for freedom, how living outside the dome subjects you to the wills of the corporations and consequences of human actions, and living within the dome allows you to be free. Robin disagrees. Thank you. Um, my piece is about uh, policing nature in protected areas and possible uh, unintended consequences of our best intentions. As the bus started to approach, Casey could see the trees looming in the distance. They were massive compared to the flatland that surrounded them. They really marked the hard boundary of the National Reserve. When she arrived, she was greeted by a pair of pleasantly bland people in green collared cotton shirts. They ushered her into the main hub of the National Reserve. It was a beautiful building, one side covered with solar panels. The shade from the trees made it pointless to have solar panels on the other side. The parts not covered in solar panels were, white, were a ripe red, helping it to stand out from the dark brown and green and black that surrounded it. Intricate patterns of multicolored knots were painted over this red. She couldn't see it now since the sun went down during her leader's bus journey, but these patterns combined with the reflection of the light from the solar panels during the day made the surface of this building almost seem to shimmer. The entire bottom floor was a dedicated museum for visitors. There were exhibits about each of the species of animals and plants in the National Reserve and many that used to live there that had now gone extinct. This was Casey's favorite place in the entire world growing up. She used to drag her parents from one exhibit to the next, and she would get them to test her on all the facts that were written on the displays. The first one she ever learnt, and the only one she never made a single mistake on, was the Grey Wolf display. She was so excited to be back, not just as a visitor, but as a contributor, that she nearly threw up. The nice but bland people took her straight through to an auditorium, where a couple dozen other bright-eyed, colorfully dressed young new interns were patiently waiting, for a talk to begin. She took her seat and looked around nervously as the last few people filtered in. Hello, I'm Alicia and I'm going to be your manager for the next three months. We're having a little bit of an emergency, 
So we're going to hold off on your training for a little bit because we need as many people to muck in and help as we can get. A murmur spread around the room with everyone speculating about this emergency. What could it be? We just got here. Things are going wrong already? All right, settle down. Thank you. So this issue has to do with one of our gray wolves here. Now, does anyone know how we make sure our wolves are fed here? Alicia paused, and Casey's hand shot straight up. Yes? Alicia looked down at her clipboard. Casey, she announced confidently. The way that we feed the wolves here is by packing up synthetically produced meat created in the lab and running various hunting scenarios for the wolves to enact so they can get the psychological benefit of the hunt and the nutritional benefit of the meat. Casey rattled off, sounding like she was reciting lines from a textbook, because she was. Very good, Casey. The goal is to make sure no unnecessary pain is felt. After all, what does being completely natural matter to a deer being slaughtered by a wolf? Alicia paused dramatically for a moment, looking around as if to watch this message sink in. Now, the emergency is that one of our wolves has escaped. She's been missing for over a week, so we really need to find her soon. So, what we need you to do is go out there and start looking for her. There's too much ground to cover by foot, but don't worry. We're given special permission by the state to use electric vehicles to get around the reserve. You're going to drive to a designated area beyond the natural reserve, and then you can get out and look on foot so you don't scare her off. After Alicia finished running through all the assigned vehicles, Casey sprinted off to find hers. She got to the vehicle bay on the back side of the building, and after a minute of sifting through the sea of identical vehicles, she found hers. They were pretty compact, two seats, same ripe red as the building behind them, with four massive wheels to deal with the terrain. Casey clambered inside and set off. She spent the journey racking her brain for any facts she'd learnt about gray wolves that she could help her, but couldn't help admiring the giant trees and plants around the ground. They were so different from the pruned and perfect plants in the city parks. These ones seemed wild and overgrown. The farther in she went, the larger and wilder the plants seemed to become. The time flew by, and before she knew it, she was at that designated spot. Casey ventured out into the wilderness, armed only with a radio and an almost disturbing amount of knowledge about gray wolves. She wandered around for hours. Checking in from time to time, no one had found any signs of anything. Casey struggled to temper her enjoyment of wandering around the woods, feeling these wild plants and leaves beneath her feet, basking in the shade provided by these giant trees, spotting deer prancing around with her anxiety about the well-being of the wolf. Casey was about to give up and turn back when she rounded a corner of a tree and saw a gray lump slumped on the ground between two trees with a deer nuzzling at it. This picturesque scene lasted only for a moment before Casey came stumbling in. The deer scurried off as soon as it heard her coming. The gray lump was undeniably a gray wolf. She fell to her knees to check on it. It was cold to the touch. She couldn't feel a pulse. It was dead. It didn't have any injuries, but it was lighter, skinnier than a wolf was supposed to be. She back, sat back in horror as she realized it had starved to death, starved to death when its natural play, prey was all around. Hello, uh, my name is Champ Turner and I'm a sophomore studying environmental studies and visual art. My speculative fiction takes place in New Zealand in the year 2084 and imagines the future of conservation in the age of metaverse capitalism. Trillionaire Guilford Castor is seeking to purchase publicly held land in the pristine South Islands Lake District to develop a massive virtual reality integrated nature park. Richie, Richie, Richie Warea, a local councilman, is pulling out all the stops he can to stop the project from going through. The passage opens with Richie and his granddaughter Hannah taking a train to a local council meeting, and we'll see a conflict between Richie and Hannah. The train started to move forward, picking up speed until the grass out the window turned into a green streak. The sun was high in the sky now, and the mountains looked more familiar and friendlier than in the morning. Just then, from the TV in the aisle, 
the sound of an all too familiar drum beat sent a shiver down Richie, Richie's spine. Instinctively, he and Hannah turned towards the noise and saw the Caster MetaVentures logo flash across the screen. It was an ad he had seen many times before on his newsfeed, but he had always flicked it away. Now he had no choice but to hear it all the way through. A deep but annoyingly sing songy American male voice narrated. Imagine, bum bum bum, flying high over breathtaking scenery. An image of a jet packed actor zooming over mountains filled the screen. Stalking prey like the ancients. A close up shot showed a camouflaged woman in a VR headset peering through the brush at a herd of giant emu like birds, the once extinct South Island Moa. And living out your wildest dreams with the whole family. A man and boy in headsets were shooting a colossal dragon out of the sky with virtual crossbows and high-fiving each other as they watched it go down. Richie groaned and mumbled something about going to the bathroom. Hannah kept watching. Caster MetaVentures presents, in partnership with Ngai Tahu Holdings, New Zealand's first ever integrated meta-virtual reality experience, Wild South Adventure Park, where the best of MVR technology meets Mother Nature's greatest landscapes for a fully immersive voyage like no other. Give it your all at the Eco Triathlon Race Course. The screen showed two boats racing over a lake, which Hannah recognized instantly as Lake Wanaka, and firing virtual cannons at each other as they maneuvered, maneuvered around buoys and smashed through virtual coins hovering above the water. Be part of the Battle of the Five Armies at Tolkien Land. Whose side will you take? Experience New Zealand in its untouched natural state, with long lost creatures brought back to life in Primeval Park. All this and more coming soon to Wild South Adventure Park. Tickets available for pre-sale this October. Wild South Adventure Park, where the only limits are your imagination. Hannah was obviously against the park, too. It was wildly unaffordable, would require massive and dubious ecological modification, and would close off access to the non-paying public. It was mostly excuse for billionaires and maybe a few trillionaires to play Tolkien and act out their other childish, fa other childish fantasies. But nonetheless, the thought of seeing real Moas brought back to life, standing 12 feet tall, not to mention their one-time predator, the hostess eagle, with a colossal 10-foot wingspan, sent a flush through Hannah's face. Hannah was obsessed with the MOA, which was now being brought back to life in emu surrogates by Castor-funded research. Soon, a preliminary breeding colony would be established on Stewart Island. And unlike the virtual dragons and orcs in Tolkien land, these would be living, breathing animals, the exact same ones that walked the islands hundreds of years ago before they were hunted to extinction. With safety web technology covering the whole park, she could get close without being in the slightest danger. The adrenaline would be all real, though. But she could never say that around her grandpa, of course. Looking out the window at the mountains, she thought of how it would look through a pair of VR goggles with all the imagery of the metaverse imposed over it. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Harry Salton. I'm a senior from New York City, and my uh, story is sort of imagining a future of New York without humans. Just north of what used to be 77th Street rises a crumbling facade of brownstone and pink granite. Here, strewn across the thick underbrush, lie stones that once used to constitute proud corner towers, leering gargoyles, and spindly turrets. The sloping roofs of these venerable halls have come crashing down. The treasures this building used to hold, those few that remained after the looting occurred, either too heavy to carry off or simply left behind, have long since fallen prey to the elements. Knotted roots and hanging vines invite themselves inside through the open windows, and mosses and lichens take up residence on the stone. The whole structure seems to be melting into the ground, unable to support its weight any longer. At one section, there are words faintly carved into the rock in block type, still legible after all these years. American Museum of Natural History. Of course, there isn't anyone around able to read the signage. And even if they could, New York's current leading residents aren't exactly the museum going types. Suddenly, cutting through the din of rush hour activity, that cacophony of bird song, buzzing insects, and wind rushing through the leaves that characterizes the start of the workday, 
one such cosmopolitan announces his presence. The cracking of wood and the shriek of branches rubbing on branches gives way to a thunderous crash as a towering poplar tree is downed. Shortly after, dragging a leafy branch eastward through the murky water of the 77th Street Channel, he paddles determinedly. Only the bulbous black nose and beady eyes affixed to the top of his broad head remain above the surface of the water. He travels with surprising speed, his wide, flat tail and webbed hind legs moving him efficiently forward. Going past the museum a few hundred yards, he reaches his destination. Here, a barrier running maybe 20 yards long has been constructed across the width of a once babbling stream. It is lined with large logs that have been fixed into place with boulders. Over this foundation is a lattice of interlocking branches and sticks. Filling in the gaps is a dense concrete of mud and vegetation. Dragging the branch out of the water onto the dam, this industrious creature's thick matted coat and dense muscular body is visible. Waddling with awkward swaying hips, it is clear that he is more comfortable in the water. He labors to the upper lip of the dam and judiciously places his branch, stemming the progress of a tiny rivulet that had formed earlier that morning. Before returning to the waters, he takes a moment to look back in the direction of the, falling, the fallen poplar. The landscape looked very different than it had back when he and his mate had first arrived. Damming the stream, they had created a sizable pond and wetland network. Rotting wood and vegetation stained the water brown that gl and gl it glinted with amber tones in the light of the still rising sun. In the still water, sediments collected, providing nutrients to the lush aquatic plants floating atop the water. Gnawed tree stumps ringed the area around the water, but they were neighbored by youthful saplings stretching up into the light, no longer blocked out by the since down trees. Though it was true that he felt a sense of ownership over this pond, he was far from its only residence. resident. Turtles and frogs sunned themselves on rocks and floating logs. Fish darted in and out of the shade provided by overhanging trees, mindful of the threats from above. Herons and osprey looking for a quick meal. Less threatening were the ducks bobbing lazily about, sifting their beaks through the algae. Some of these creatures were Upper West Side mainstays, but some were new to the neighborhood, attracted by the emerging habitat. Far in the distance, he can make out the massive figure of a lone moose. He slips back into the water, satisfied with the stability of the dam. He is no less an architect than the men who built the now crumbling museum. Though he is its first custodian, he knows this structure will remain long after he is gone. Hello, my name is Alicia. I'm a junior at Brown studying biology and public health, and my piece of speculative fiction has to do with the concept of animal citizenship. It was that time of the year where election frenzy was running rampant. The front runner for the race was Greg, the governor for the last three terms. He kept things from falling apart. No one had anything bad to say about him, but if you approached a stranger walking down the street, you probably couldn't find anyone who had something good to say. He ran unopposed for the majority of his political career, aside from one year when a flat earther took up candidacy. They were head to head for the majority of the race until an interview asked them their plans if they won governorship. With a gentle smirk, smirk they responded, road roll all the globes from the schools. This year, however, Greg had some reason to worry. New to the legislative scene, Greg's newfound competition was causing a stir in the state's usual boring political climate. Doug, which was his full legal name, made headlines as the most progressive candidate to date. There's no better way to perk people's ears than to promise a future with true equality under law. Doug demanded that the state take responsibility for the mistreatment of groups that were forced to reside on the lowest steps of the power hierarchy. Yes, he was controversial, but people were listening. To top it all, all off, no one actually knew what he looked like. Unlike most politicians who centered their days leading up to the election around public appearances, Doug only communicated through his Twitter account and occasional statements to the press. 
While Greg was kissing babies and shaking hands with billionaires, Doug was chewing over the ways to fulfill his utopic campaign promises. The days immediately after the election were tense. Even Doug's most zealous supporters were a bit doubtful when a winner wasn't announced after more than a couple of days. The only thing anyone knew was that it was close, unprecedentedly close. After two recounts, news broke that Gregory Balfour had lost the gubernatorial race to first-time runner Doug. Though not particularly an upset, shock resonated around the region. When it came to make an appearance, though, a small-statured woman took his place in front of the cameras and read a statement from Doug. To my beautiful state, I prepared this note with the intention of it being read aloud if I won, but to live in this reality now is truly a moment I could have never imagined coming to fruition. Firstly, I thank you greatly for trusting me to pursue justice and represent those who have lacked true representation since the birth of government herself. Like I've said, I will do anything in and outside of my power to make this state one that serves as a home for those not traditionally housed by institutions of power that seek to only protect the people that looked and act like themselves. However, I do have something to disclose before I can officially start my term. I, Doug, am not the species of Homo sapiens. Specifically, I belong to Canis lupus familiaris, or what many of you knew, m might know as a poodle. This is probably shocking to most of you. The woman here reading my note is my dear friend, Laura Meyer, and she helps to translate my thoughts, my dreams, my ambitions, etc., to which I've had the opportunity to share with you all. Our relationship started as Laura was originally my owner, as one would say, but soon after, as I started to show enough cognitive ability through tricks and other human baselines for intelligence of their pets, Laura began to give me other opportunities for enrichment. Quickly, we evolved together from understanding cues to having stimulated conversations, and now here, to announcing my acceptance speech into office. Anyway, I imagine that the legality of a dog running for governor is crossing the minds of many. I've done diligent research, and in this state, the qualifications to run for office are only that I am above the age of 18 and have lived in the state for at least four years, both of which I have met the conditions for. Now, if anyone has questions, please feel free to reach me at my office. Best, Doug. The controversy following the speech was astronomical, as expected, but true to Doug's word, he was an eligible candidate for office and could even run in three other states, New Hampshire, Kansas, and Vermont, if you're curious. His term was the best the state's ever seen, and he remained governor until his death at the ripe old age of 23. On the 10th anniversary of his first gubernatorial win, Laura published the manifesto Doug had spent the latter half of his life writing. In it, he fights for the right to sit and strip for animals like himself and calls for his supporters, which amounted to many, to help achieve this goal for others not as fortunate himself. It's been a slow fight, but that's not to say that it isn't a world worth believing. Hello, my name is Masha Trifonova. I'm a freshman here at Brown, and my piece is about naturalness and human altered nature. So she stood here, hissing and mowing, slender, with naked skin, rising high the twisted spine, with a thin tail whipping the grounds. Judy raised the gun. The puma hissed in hesitation, rolling over her kittens. Judy had never seen this kind before. Radiation altered them before the enclave could react collecting non-altered animals into the underground heavens. This puma can spoil the genetic material with her kittens, taking a mate that could give a perfect, natural offspring. Judy took the shooting position. The puma growled, opening wide the giant watery eyes and tearing the cold wasteland with crooked claws. Judy saw herself in the puma's eyes, a small figure in an ugly armor, all shaggy after years of radiation exposure. She recalled her children, Emma with six fingers, and Joy, with all his allergies, she looked at the kittens. <clears throat> she held back and walked away and never told anyone. Yet sometimes, when she walked past the con conservation heavens, she felt uneasy near these perfect, natural, and altered animals. And she would recall the wasteland puma and her kittens, and then go and look at Emma and Joe playing, and then lie in her bed, feeling the radiation deep inside her bones, and wondering why someone would hesitate to shoot her. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> um, my name is Emily, and I'm a first year here at Brown studying environmental science and economics. And today I'll be reading a short sci-fi piece I wrote. Tap, tap, tap. 
April was rudely awoken by incessant tapping. Stretching, she turned her head slightly to the left and came face to face with a bulbous brown beak. It was a giant dodo bird. <laughs> it was perched on top of the large rubber tree right outside her veranda, squawking loudly, eyeing the bowl of Brazil nuts on her nightstand. Next to it was an Amazonian two-toed sloth, slowly inching its way across one of the many thick vines entwining the rubber tree. Thank God she had closed the window last night. Otherwise, she would have woken up to a very large, hungry bird towering over her. She quickly changed into a white t-shirt and cargo pants and set out for her daily rounds. She lived in the middle of San Francisco, the biggest eco-urban metropolis on the Earth post the warmth, a sudden global warming event brought upon by anthropogenic climate change. The Earth did change quite a bit since climate change had started. The Eurasian and American continental plates had clashed together as a result of a massive asteroid impact, merging to form a continental plate resembling Pangea, Pangea. hence the new continent's name, Pangea II. The radioactive heat from the massive asteroid impact accelerated tectonic shift, leading to the merge. The impact of the asteroid was similar to that of the one that killed all the dinosaurs, but instead of the dinosaurs, it was the human population that had been nearly all annihilated. But here she was, one of the handful of humans still living on Earth, studying to be a paleozoologist. Since the warmth and the merge, most of the Earth's landmass had turned into a rainforest biota, so the remaining humans made it their goal to repopulate the Earth with once extinct species native to the current climate via de-extinction. Jaguars prowled the jungle floor next to saber-toothed tigers, Amazonian river dolphins swam along ammonites, and flying reptiles resembling pterodactyls soared the sky with white-throated toucans. Humans were no longer at the top of the food chain. They came to the realization that other species and nature had to be respected and that, pe and that peaceful coexistence had to occur unless they wanted more catastrophic events like the warmth and the merge. It was a hard lesson learned that mother nature could only take so much before things were thrown out of equilibrium. April was exhausted once she had finished her daily su species census in her assigned one kilometer squared mile area. Flopping back into her bed, she crawled into her sheets and was about to fall asleep when she heard thump, thump, thump. She sighed. Who was it at the window now? All right, we have a couple minutes left, but uh, let's give another hand to our student presenters. Happy to take any questions from the audience or from the online audience if that's if that is possible, if anyone has comments or questions. Yeah, Lucy. Well, I just want to say thank you for sharing your, your work. Um, I really enjoyed the variety. Of, there was a variety, but there was also a theme around, you know, where do humans belong in this, in this future? So I really, I really liked that theme of the different ways you were envisioning, you know, how we could find a new balance, and that was just and fair. So I, I, I like that and uh, appreciate all that you um, are thinking about. And uh, what you're thinking about, we're really good to what and Heather was thinking about, what our exhibit, and just um, keep doing what you're doing and uh, um, keep talking, keep writing. Um, really appreciated that. We do have a workshop tomorrow morning, which is a kind of practice taking science and being creative with it. You're already good at it, but um, we'd love to have you there as well. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Um, so I should uh, invite everyone to stay with us for the rest of the day's programming. Um, up next at 10 a.m., we have the Art and Science of Hummingbirds and the Florentine Codex, past and present, with Iris Montero and Rachel Berwick. So please uh, stick around for that. Um, but uh, I will end this part of the the morning's program, and again, thank you all for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>